This episode is part of a special collaboration between ACM Bytecast and AMIA For Your Informatics Podcast, a joint podcast series for the Association of Computing Machinery, the world's largest educational and scientific computing society, and the American Medical Informatics Association, the world's largest medical informatics community. In this new series, we talk to women leaders, researchers, practitioners, and innovators who are at the intersection of computing research and practice to apply AI to healthcare and life science. They share their experiences in their interdisciplinary career paths, the lessons learned for health equity, and their own visions for the future of computing. Hey, hello, and welcome to the ACM AMIA Joint Podcast Series. This joint podcast series aims to explore the interdisciplinary field of medical informatics, where both the practitioners of AI ML solution builders and the stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem take interest. I'm Dr. Sabrina Jay from the Association of Computing Machinery Bycast Series. And co-hosting with me today is Dr. Carmen Williams from Your Informatics Podcast with the American Medical Informatics Association. We have the pleasure of speaking with our guest today, Dr. Francesca Rossi. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Francesca Rossi is an IBM fellow and an IBM AI ethics global leader. She works at TJ Watson IBM Research Lab in New York. Her research interests focus on artificial intelligence and ethical issues in the development and behavior of AI systems, in particular for decision support systems for group decision making. Dr. Rossi has published over 200 scientific articles in journals, in conference proceedings, volume, between conference proceedings, collections of contributions, special issues of journals, and a handbook. She is a fellow of both the Worldwide Association of AI Triple AI and the European one, which is Euro AI. She has been the president of the International Joint Conference on AI and executive counselor of Triple AI and the editor in chief of the Journal of AI Research. Dr. Rossi is involved in multiple AI committees, both in the US and Europe, and we are so excited to have the chance to speak with her more today. So thank you again for joining us. Thanks. Yeah. So, Dr. Rossi. You have been working in this interdisciplinary field between computer science and ethics. What makes you decide to start your career on this path initially? Did anything particular motivate you that you will call out? As yeah, a sure, milestone? sure. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, two things. No? When I decided to study AI, it was... Uh, well, first, when I decided to study computer science, uh, that was the first decision that brought me on this path. And I think it was because uh, I felt that at that time, there were not many in Italy. I was in Italy. There were not many computer science curricula in the various universities. So I felt it was something for the future that I was doing something new. And that was exciting for me. So that's for computer science. Then uh, in my master thesis, I decided to do it on AI. And that's where I started working on AI. And I continued and I still am working on AI. And that also was an additional thing. It was uh, an additional feeling that really this uh, science, more, you know, a technology, but also the science of AI was really allowing me to build things where they were new, they were shaping the future. So even more than when I chose computer science. And then after many, many years working in AI and teaching and doing research with my students and so on, I was a, a university professor teaching and, and researching in AI for more than 20 something years. Then I went uh, one year on sabbatical at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard University. And that place is a really a crash course in multidisciplinarity because during the year that uh, people spend there, every year there are about 50 fellows at the Radcliffe Institute, and they all come from different disciplines. So there are I was the only computer scientist there. And then there were people covering all the other sciences, all the arts, and all the humanities. And then the staff of this institute forces these people 
to work together, to spend time together. I say forces because it doesn't come very natural at first, because these people are used to work only with the people similar to them, but really it was very, very learning experience and in uh, communicating and working with people that had different background, different questions in their mind. And that was where I started to think not only about the technical and scientific aspects of AI, but also about the impact on society. And that's why when uh, I started thinking about uh, the ethics of AI and uh, the impact on people, on society, the way we live, the way we interact, the way we work. So after that sabbatical year, instead of going back to my university professor role, I decided to join IBM. And then since then, I increased inside the company more and more this activity around the ethics of AI. So that was a pivotal moment, I think, because I learned what it means to think about to think about the social aspect rather than just about the technological and scientific aspects of AI. Thank you. And and you talked about some of those interdisciplinary challenges, such as forcing everybody had to force together. And so were there any other challenges or or how did you overcome this challenge? Well, one initial challenge, uh, if you want to call it challenge, is that these people that come from different backgrounds use different terms, even different, different terminology, no? different words. So it's already an initial phase where you need to be able to synchronize and do some uh, translation between the languages uh, in order to be able to then be effective in working together, because if you don't even understand each other. And I found this uh, at, during that sabbatical year, but then I found this challenge also later on, for example, when uh, I was um, for two years in the European Commission High Level Esper Group on AI. This is a group was a group that worked on 2018 to 2020 for two years to define the ethics guidelines for AI in Europe. And these 52 people were very different. They were experts of AI, but less than 10. And then there were civil society organizations, consumer rights uh, organizations, uh, and so all, all philosophers, uh, psychologists, and all sociologists, and so on. And so the first, the, so the, the mandate of that group was to write these ethic guidelines for AI Europe. We realized at the first meeting that these 52 people basically had 52 ideas of what AI was. So the first thing that we needed to do is actually publish an additional document that really was saying this is what AI means after discussing among these 52 people. so to, And then we could start thinking about the ethic guidelines for AI Europe. So that was the way we solved the challenge there. But the challenge was also within IBM because when we started building the governance around AI ethics and involving all the divisions of the company in uh, the activities around AI ethics, of course, this People were very different in different areas. There were AI researchers, there were people in marketing, uh, communication, there were the legal people, there were the people doing products, software, and so on. So all very different people. So the first thing we did was to build a glossary, a glossary of terms around AI and AI ethics and with their definition so that everybody could look up at the glossary in case there was any doubt, you know, and that was the agreement that these different people uh, had reached about the terminology. So the terminology phase is the initial one. Of course, it can be evolved because terms are added and so on, but that is something that needs to be solved. Otherwise, you cannot work well together in an interdisciplinary environment. Yeah, I can totally resonate with what you say here. It sounds a lot like what we are experiencing in our own company as well. Yeah, but I want to take it back a little bit to also understand. So this kind of translation between interdisciplinary field is certainly difficult, right? But And challenge, but you manage to do it well. Is that what leads you to your current role? Or is there anything else you will say that inspire you to pursue 
the current career path? Yeah, well, you... when I when I joined IBM, it was also a moment in time where there was a lot of initial discussion about uh, these issues with AI. You know, the first uh, algorithms that were shown to be making discriminations, for example. So, so there were the first discussion coming up, you know, what does it mean that, that this technology is beneficial to people, to society, and so on. So with that uh, in mind, and, and uh, I was fortunate enough that during my sabbatical year, before joining IBM, I, I joined the, the advisory board of the Future of Life Institute that was very pioneer in uh, convening these discussions about uh, the ethics of AI. So then when I joined IBM, I started also a multi-division discussion group around these issues, but it was very kind of all over the place at the beginning, right? And then this discussion group was transformed into a first a version of the AI ethics board inside the company. Uh, so an initial version of the governance around AI ethics, where we defined our principles, we defined some partnerships with external organizations, we defined some activities, but then it was not uh, a decision-making board. It was mostly a coordination and discussion board. And then uh, a few years later, it was transformed into a really decision-making uh, governance body, which makes decisions about uh, not just the principles of a high-level thing, but also about the concrete activities that the company has. So it was a natural, uh, I think, uh, phases, uh, one after the other one, that led to more and more concrete, from very high-level principles to very concrete uh, actions. Yeah, and I think you've already talked about this quite a bit, but we know that many industries and companies are already, they have established their responsible and ethical AI guidelines. We see the the new kind of coming in of generative AI and the additional risk that could come with that. And so what do you see as the current status in enabling ethical and responsible AI? And then if you're going to score, you know, for progress collectively as a field, how would you rate it? Yeah, so as I said, you know, these phases uh, happen not only in my personal experience, but I think in many other organizations. So the first phase was mostly about being aware of the issues that were, you know, with the uses of AI. And then uh, the second phase was principles. Everybody published principles. I think that Harvard there was a project called the, the Principled AI Project and collected all the principles that were around AI ethics that were published by any kind of organization. There were more than 100 sets of principles, many of them overlapping, but from different angles, you know, from companies, governments, uh, uh, universities, uh, multi-stakeholder organizations, so on. So first phase awareness, second phase principles, and then the more practical phase, you know. So, okay, so how do we implement this principle? How do we integrate uh, the implementation of this principle inside our own organization. And I think that these three phases, and we are still then in the practical phase, implementing the principles into concrete actions, whether these actions could be like uh, risk case assessments, uh, pro uh, processes, or uh, educational material for everybody, the, the developers and everybody else, or software tools, or even uh, diversity in the composition of the team, or the governance uh, bodies like the AI at this board that we have. So all these pieces uh, of very concrete actions came out of these principles that were very high level and principles are very nice. They said, you know, like a North Star, but uh, developers need something more concrete than the principles. So, and of course, as you say, with the evolution of the technology, like with machine learning and then generative AI and so on, these actions need to be also updated no? over time. That's why, for example, recently we published a, a very large table of uh, foundation model risks and comparing them to the risks that we already were aware of for traditional kind of machine learning approaches to see which ones remain the same with generative AI, which ones are amplified, and which ones are completely new. And so they need new tools or updates on the tools, new educational material, new consultations, and so on. So I think that I saw, I mean, it's like uh, I saw a, a continuous trend in 
in increasing these activities and also increasing the number of people that work on this inside the company as well as the resources and not only increasing but increasing not in a linear way but a kind of an exponential way you know at the beginning it was maybe going a little bit slow blah, 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 and then room you know it grows exponentially very rapidly also because there are uh, forces that push in this direction that come, for example, for the point of view of IBM, come from, yes, governments that uh, are uh, more are increasingly generating laws about AI, but also clients themselves that want to know what we do about for their solution that we provide and what we do about these AI ethics issues. So, so governments, clients, media, tension, so a lot of internal but also external forces that push and make this area grow. Yeah, so there are so many areas we can grow here, right? And certainly we never have enough people on this. We see the need for this everywhere we go. Um, with so many AI regulation coming up on the horizon as well, certainly a lot of people are being kept awake at night. Uh, we're wondering that for you, as particular in your capacity as the uh, current president of Triple AI, right? So, who are those issues that keep you awake at night? And are there particular regulation or particular risks that you worry the most? And also the follow-up question for that will be like for professional societies like us, like AAAI, like ACM, what can we do, right, to, to get our plan together? So as we said, you know, the technology evolves and brings about and the uses of these new techniques in AI that bring about additional uh, opportunities, but also additional questions about and, and legitimate questions about uh, possible risks in the uses. So, for example, for generative AI, so for, for classical machine learning, of course, uh, there are the usual issues related to fairness, yeah. so the presence of bias, so the ability to detect and mitigate bias in an AI system, in the training data, and so on but also the uh, sometimes the lack of explainability. So it's kind of a black box, uh, the, the system that produces an output, but we don't know how it get, gets the output from the input. The transparency issue that where, you know, those that produce the system need to be transparent enough to say how they built it. The privacy issue, of course, because machine learning relies on data. So all the data issues that are including the privacy ones. And then with generative AI, of course, the issues related to the content that is generated. So issues related to misinformation, because we know that uh, uh, generative AI is uh, extremely excellent in uh, the uh, writing text or generating images that are very realistic and even text very, very perfect from the syntactic point of view. But sometimes it makes some mistakes, factual mistakes. So we need to be aware of that if we want to use it. it, it the fact that it makes these mistakes, it doesn't mean that it's not usable and it's not uh, cannot be useful in many scenarios, but we need to be aware of that in order to use it in the most appropriate way. So if you ask, for example, for factual information, it's better to check, double check that factual information with other trusted sources, for example. And then, of course, there are uh, other issues related to misinformation, but they are not related to l limitations or mistakes of the AI system, but actually on how humans decide intentionally to use these AI systems, such as, you know, deep fakes, you know, and that can uh, uh, impact our society by manipulating, you know, public opinion and so possibly disrupting even the democratic process, the elections, the candidates, and so uh, so the impact on society, as well as uh, the impact uh, on the of these AI systems in uh, the education system, for example. You know, we know the students are using uh, some of these systems to bypass the learning process, uh, to write their own essays, you know, and that's something, you know, that... Uh, should be resolved. Even in the research community, and I see that at AAAI, uh, there are people that uh, write some 
parts of the papers through these uh, technologies or even parts of the reviews of the paper through these technologies. So uh, we need to be aware of uh, possible actors that may use inappropriately these tools because the tools should be used, but should be used in the right way. So it is to augment our own capabilities, to help us grow and do things that are higher level than what we were we could do earlier and not to bypass any process that can be helpful for us uh, to grow. So again, so there are uh, several issues, but most of the issues are, in my view, related to two things. One, that the technology still has limitation, has capabilities and limitations. So the typical case is this hallucination thing. This is a limitation of the technology. Maybe in the future, by building the technology in different ways, maybe we will overcome this thing, okay? But for now, we have to be aware that this is a limitation. And then other, other risks are related to the risk of how we decide to use the technology. So whether we decide to use it in, a, in an out, completely fully autonomous way, when is not the right scenarios to use it fully autonomously, for example, and we need to have human oversight or human in the loop. So these are the two things, limitations of the technology and uh, misuse, I would say. Yeah. So are there things you feel that professional society can do a little bit more? On top yeah, well, of uh, uh, professional scientific societies uh, like ACM, uh, IIII and EMIA, they can certainly raise the awareness. So, for example... Even in the mission of AAAI, the mission of AAAI is to advance AI research and the responsible use of AI. So it's already in the mission since the start that is not only to advance the technology per se, that's not the ultimate goal, but the ultimate goal is to make sure that it's used responsibly. So awareness. Also, another thing that AAAI is uh, is doing is also to consult with the policymakers. So to help policymakers understand, and this can come from scientific and professional society, but it can also come from companies, from others that are more technically involved. So to help policymakers understand what is the best way to regulate AI, if there is a need to regulate it and how, you know, and uh, so that's uh, why I think... Uh, uh, what the European Commission did with the European AI Act was very wise because it really started with these uh, multi-stakeholder consultations where people from different areas, including professional scientific societies, could say, okay, I think from my expertise, from my knowledge of AI, I, I think this, this, this should be you know, adv advice about how to regulate AI. So that's another area where this uh, association can do. But of course, uh, being an association that uh, organizes events like conferences, like you mentioned, you know, co several conferences, Triple AI as conferences, symposia, and many other things, I think that uh, to raise the awareness of the researchers themselves uh, that uh, this is AI is not a science and technology only at this point, but is a social scientific technological field. So to help researchers be exposed also to the social aspect and considerations that they need to make whenever they do their research. For example, at AAAI, whenever people submit a paper to the conference, we ask them to write a, a section in the paper to discuss the ethical, possible ethical implications of the work that they're doing. So that is something to raise awareness in research because the next generation of researchers will have to be more multidisciplinary, more social, technical than what we had in the past, than, than the way I was educated, for example. Yeah, yeah, totally with you. Yeah, in AMIA, we have been hosting the AMIA showcase for three years in a row, right? And we do that to, to ask all the submitters of the AI evaluation for their ethical consideration to be added in different stages of their health AI evaluation. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up, that really important point. And also for that multi-stakeholder view, one thing that I think both ACN and AMIA has been doing is to bring awareness and bring more multiple parties on the table. 
together to generate consensus from community first, right? Yeah. And so another yeah. thing that uh, actually AAA is doing together with ACM is to co-organize a conference called AI Ethics and Society, which is exactly this attempt to put together in the same place, in the same event, in the same conference, uh, researchers and scientists from different disciplines. So this conference, for example, has four program chairs, one from AI, one from philosophy, one from psychology, one from policy. So and and then the papers and the, and the papers, posters and invited talks and so on are all very multidisciplinary. So and that was uh, a way for ACM and AAAI to really get together in this uh, multidisciplinary way, not just uh, as uh, technology, you know, associations. Right. Yeah. And, and in this multi-stakeholder view, did you find any particular party's voice is lacking? Like at least like in AMIA, what we find is a patient's voice is often missing on the table, right? That's why we need to bring extra effort to bring them in. Like last year, we had this conference with Harvard Medical School to make sure that we had the patient advocates also in that. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good point. Of course, uh, in that case, it's patients, but in general, it's the communities that are impacted by whatever these researchers or developers are building, right? And this is true that usually this voice is not too present. It may be present, for example, I've seen uh, even at this conference, AI Ethics Society, that happens every year. Last time I've seen a lot of papers describing studies, for example, where they were asking even some of them were related to healthcare. They were asking the impact of AI on the doctors, on the patients, and so on. But the conference itself did not have these communities present there. The pa- some of the papers were describing the results of these of these uh, surveys, of these consultations. But it's true that the co- those communities themselves were not present at the conference. So they were present only because they were in the papers as being part of the study in the, in the described in the papers so you're right that most of the people at this conference for example are those that produce the technology or produce the solution based on the technologies and then they also do their own study at home and then they come to the conference and present the result of the study but we don't see a lot of that community that is impacted by the work ACM Bycast and AMIA FYI Podcast are available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and other services. If you're enjoying this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite platform. Wonderful. Yeah. And then um, in your various roles, and very much so a pioneer in this area, are there any changes you are proud that you've been able to facilitate? And then for that matter, are there any new changes that you would suggest? So within this uh, journey, even within IBM uh, that we did uh, inside the company, I think the idea of building this internal board, that's something that I really feel that it was the right thing to do. And in fact, that was was started all these very concrete activities, which I did not do by myself, of course, with a lot of other people and the companies and, and the other uh, division put in resources and so on. But this initial idea of uh, really n- uh, the need for a governance, centralized governance, inside uh, such a big uh, and global organization like this company, I think it was the right thing to do and to pitch and to be insisting at the beginning inside the company to to build it. And because, again, uh, in a global company, it's important that uh, this governance is centralized, although it's very connected to all the the divisions uh, and to all the different roles. But it's important that it's centralized because, again, uh, uh, we cannot have different standards in different countries. No, a, a company that has offices everywhere in the world, basically, w- you want to have the same principles and the same standards of uh, risk assessment, uh, evaluation of uh, or use of the tools, uh, thresholds for bias, whatever, all over whatever the company does, all over the world, independently of uh, whether 
there is a law that requires that in that region of the world or not. So, and that already sets a very nice uh, uh, attitude that uh, AI ethics is not about uh, just uh, complying to some law, so waiting for the law, and then when the law is there, you have to comply, of course, but really being very proactive and saying, this is what, this is what I, I want to do, this is how I want to behave with this technology, this is what I want to do, no matter whether there is a law that forces me to do that or not. And that... I think it's implicit in this initial idea that I had of having this centralized governance like the AI ethics uh, board. Yeah, and there there is a new generation of informatics computer scientists who will be listening to this uh, podcast episode who will be interested in diving more with you on this area. Are there any suggestions for where they should start? And we are well, well, first of all, there are on, at this point there are many books on AI ethics, AI and also AI ethics. There are really many books uh, that uh, tackle these uh, issues uh, from different angles. So there, I mean, there are really many, many different books uh, that one can read. But even just going to these conferences, like uh, the one that I mentioned, the AI ethics and society, and because at these conferences, uh, people then can get an idea, no? That you walk around, you talk with people. Usually in this conference, there are paper presentations, invited talk, but then also there are poster sessions. So in the poster session, you can go up to the authors, ask, uh, discuss. So you get an idea of what people are doing and what are the main issues that are being addressed, you know, what are the main solutions that people put in place. Uh, and so that is a nice uh, way to be engaging with that community of people that uh, multidisciplinary community that uh, thinks about these issues and and there's uh, concrete uh, solutions puts in place concrete solution for the AI, um, AI ethics but also uh, that you find also companies at these conferences at triple AI for example they are usually not companies so if you have in mind to change your career or do something and see you can you get to see the internship opportunities or the even the p- full position opportunities that are around uh, that area yeah, and you've given such good, really good insight on this. And so um, stepping back a little bit, reflecting on your own career, what might be some of those things that early career moves that you made that you, when thinking back, you're like, oh, this will be really useful. I could recommend this for newcomers. And then for that matter, even mid-career, what were some of the things that you did? So what would be your advice for those who are exploring maybe different career paths in this area? So again, m- my... Uh, early career, it was not very multidisciplinary. Even mid-career, it was not multidisciplinary because I had more than 20 years in academia where I was doing AI and I was only talking to AI people. And uh, that, uh, of course, is very much, uh, is very nice because you are in your comfort zone. No, So you are there, you know, you talk to people that completely understand you. So uh, it's uh, very comfortable being in that position. But then I would, you know, then when I decided to go a little bit out of my comfort zone with this sabbatical year at the Radcliffe Institute, that was really, you know, an eye-opening thing. And so it was maybe more challenging than than remaining in my comfort zone, of course, but it was really an eye-opening. And then not only eye-opening to me, but also opening a lot more possibilities and opportunities to me that were not... uh, were not in, in you know in the landscape before that. So the only suggestion that I can give is really to not be afraid to experiment and uh, to go out of the comfort zone and to work or, or collaborate with people that are very different. Because again, it may be a bit challenging at first, but then it's really very rewarding, and you really feel that you can have an impact outside your vertical. And so you can, you can really, I mean, have an impact also on other disciplines or learn also a lot, because if you keep talking to the same people or the same kind of people, yeah, you learn because, but you can learn much more if you start talking and working with people that are very different from you. So that was the, and, and of course, 
in my case, I did not do that for many, many years. No, and but then when I decided to do it, I said, "Oh my God, why didn't I do it earlier?" No, so, but it was the right mo- the right moment in time. But again, I think that not necessarily like I did it that I moved from academia to a company from uh, Europe uh, to US. I mean, it doesn't have the, to be that drastic change, but to really go out and and uh, be aware of the fact that even if you are working in a technology, the right stakeholders are not just technological people. There are many stakeholders of that technology that are outside the technology and they are societal stakeholders. And so the best way to advance the technology and the science is to consult with these other stakeholders. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons we started this podcast series that we want to start exposing our new generation to this kind of interdisciplinary field so they can learn how to speak the language differently and to be more brave as what you have experienced, right? to step out of your comfort zone. Yeah. In order to- so I remember, for example, that few, until uh, several years ago, it was okay at some, for example, at the triple AI conference or some other AI conference, it was okay that some uh, uh, author presenting his own paper, technological paper, you know, about AI. I remember that people were asking, oh, but what about the societal impact? And then say, oh, I'm just a researcher in AI. Somebody else will take care of the societal impact. So this maybe was okay many years ago. Now, in the last 10 years, it's clear that this answer is not okay anymore. It's not acceptable. So you are a researcher, you do the technology, you do the science, but you need to be aware of the societal, potential societal impact and be able to answer the question that uh, related to the societal impact. So that's an evolution that really is very important. Right. And, and that leads us back to our next question, which is coming back to our discussion about professional societies a little bit, right? So in this intersection, we definitely all been experiencing the need of talking to people in different fields, in AAAI, in ACM, in AMIA. Um, so are there particular activities that you feel that will have great potential for this different professional society that they seem to be touching on different audience, but in, in the end of the day, might be really the same group of people in the future. Right? So how do we explore together? Yeah, no, I think that there are many things that can be done together. Joint events, joint, uh, not necessarily full conferences, but even joint uh, events, parts of the conference. So for example, AAAI as an annual conference with more than four or five thousand people, but then it has also spring and fall and summer symposium, which are kind of workshop like, much more informal and smaller events. So those could be joint. Also, within the AAAI conference, there is a program that we started a few years ago that is called the Bridge Program, that is exactly to build bridges between AI and other communities. AI and the vertical uh, sector, AI and something else. So that could also be a place uh, where, you know, it could be joint, uh, uh, one of the bridge, uh, let's say, events could be about AI and uh, ACM and MI, you know, doing something together related to health uh, informatics or, or anything related to that. So there are many activities that can be done. For example, there can be even joint uh, issues. For example, uh, AAAI has a magazine called the AI Magazine that is available to everybody, also non, non AAAI members. And this magazine has uh, issues with ver- various articles. There could be, and each issue has a team. So there could be a team that is, you know, this joint uh, interest uh, around uh, AI and healthcare or uh, other topics. So I mean, from the point of view of AAAI, I think there are many things that uh, can be done jointly by these uh, professional and scientific associations. Yeah, that's very helpful. I think um, even thinking how AI we know is not new to like computer scientists, definitely in natural language processing. And so we've seen it try it over and over again, maybe for the last 40 years. But lately we see there's maturity of infrastructure, support to large-scale computing, 
And even the availability of pre-trained models definitely has increased the access to things that we previously were maybe like research-only technologies. So this has led to many real-world applications, definitely in healthcare as well. And so in your mind, what is the most important AI application thus far? And then what do you see um, that's coming up that we're like, this is really important? So, well, first of all, maybe the, the, I'm sure you are much more experienced than me in understanding what's the best application so far of AI in healthcare. But I would say anything that uh, requires the analysis and the interpretation of large amounts of data, this is what AI uh, and machine learning techniques are very good at, in, uh, again, supporting the activities of the health uh, professionals in making decisions based on a more sophisticated analysis of the data. So whether it's uh, radiology or whether it's something else, you know, whenever there is a lot of data to be analyzed, I think that AI can help. Again, being careful about what should be automated and what should be instead given as knowledge from data, knowledge to the doctors, to the health professionals, so they can make more informed decisions. But for the future, I think that um, uh, healthcare is still done in a very siloed, uh, vertical uh, way, no, just like education in some sense. Education, at least uh, when I studied, and I think in Italy still, when people study at the university, they either study informatics or philosophy or psychology. I mean, they're very vertical things. And uh, I think that the way the health of a person is still uh, handled is a bit like vertical. Now you have a specialist in this area and then a specialist in this other area and a specialist in this other area. So I think that AI can help to have a more holistic approach to healthcare that I have the impression that could uh, help, you know, in uh, higher success of resolution of issues in the health of a person. So a more holistic approach where data coming from different you know, uh, sectors, disciplines within the health of a person can be combined to get a better idea of what uh, can be done about the health of a person. And then, of course, there are all sorts of uh, even preventive closed loops or closed loops approaches where AI can be combined with neurotechnologies, for example, that uh, can read data from sensors, but they can also write data into the central nervous system, for example. I think, for example, as some things that are already available, maybe only in the labs, uh, there is uh, or, or few uh, few situations like uh, those closed loops where for patients uh, to anticipate uh, and uh, mitigate. Uh, Epileptic scissors, for example, no, the data collected, AI that uh, interpret them, uh, predicts that there will be a, 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 a scissor, and then the neurotechnology that injects some some substance to mitigate that, or similar one for uh, uh, treating or uh, mitigating uh, Parkinson uh, tremor. So this closed loop where the AI is combined with other technologies for example, neurotechnologies, to to help uh, in a very ongoing, always ongoing uh, sensory information analysis and then uh, intervention. So uh, that to me is, is, a, is a very interesting uh, uh, avenue. The future can be expanded from these two examples that I gave. Yeah, and whether it's uh, healthcare or not, right? So this this then has to be evaluated before they can put into the real world scenarios and really to be practically used. Um, so I'm wondering, in terms of evaluation, did you see that any important pieces there that should be included in your mind? And, and since there are so many guidelines out there, right? So sometimes, yeah, of don't... course. I mean, I mean, the more uh, we are uh, using these uh, technologies uh, in, uh, in making decisions that are affecting people's life, like healthcare, 
financial well-being, you know, a, a very important aspect of the well-being, overall well-being of a person. And the more we have to be careful about uh, the technologies that we employ, we have to vet them, we have to uh, evaluate them over common benchmarks, for example, that are related to the scenario where you want to deploy these technologies. The risk assessment framework, for example, NIST in the in the US has developed a risk assessment framework in general, not just for specific sectors, for AI. And this is something that uh, uh, can be standardized to agree on what is the right way to evaluate, you know, whether it's benchmark, whether it's standards, whether it's uh, some uh, thresholds in the risk assessment. So the evaluation, of, or whether it's internal or external red teaming, you know, there is a lot of discussion right now about red teaming, AI, uh, large language models, and so on. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, agreeing on what are the right benchmarks or what are the right ways to evaluate is very important. Uh, long uh, some many years ago in AI, this was not some very common uh, no, to have uh, an agreement. The first time that uh, uh, researchers in AI agreed uh, on some benchmarks to evaluate AI system on a common uh, common set of benchmarks is when uh, the ImageNet uh, database was put together. Because for the first time, you say, "Oh, okay, everybody working on image interpretation should use should tell me how." the system behaves on that same database, you know, or the data set of images. Then, of course, we discovered that there were issues with this data set. But the point of having a common benchmark, a common data set to use to evaluate, that's very important. Yeah, and that set up the success for transformer and many now technology transforming invention that we have seen in this field, right? Only yeah, so we- so there are many. So of course that uh, ImageNet is less used now, but there are more and more benchmarks uh, to evaluate the capabilities of this AI system. Of course, we have to be kind of careful to evaluate uh, over the right benchmarks. For example, I've seen a lot of evaluation of large language models uh, over benchmarks that we use to evaluate human beings. For example, the bar exam or the ex- admission exam. But of course, those are fought for human beings, for the, capabil- for the capabilities of the human brain and not for <laughs> machines. So, for example, machines... Uh, are very different uh, in capabilities. Uh, for example, they have uh, an almost infinite memory because I can add, you know, as many as many things I want, and almost perfect memory. This is something that we don't have as human beings. So I don't think it's very appropriate to use benchmarks, the same benchmarks that we would use, the same tests that we would use for human beings. Yeah, that's a good point. We should also test machine for reasoning and planning, right? <laughs> Which humans are best at. Yeah. And, and did you see any industrial standards emerging at all? Like, for- Well, in AI and AI ethics, there are still, there are already several initiatives from many standard organizations. So I think the first one to have standards around AI ethics ethics, not just AI, is IEEE. IEEE is a global association no, that also has a standard part. For example, IEEE is the organization that uh, uh, defined the global standard for Wi-Fi. The reason why we can go everywhere, everywhere in the world with our computer and plug into our Wi-Fi is because everybody uses this. So IEEE is very active standard uh, as organization and they had uh, put together already several years ago a program of standards called the P7000 program of, with about, uh, I think, 13 or 14 standards all about AI ethics. Uh, one is about fairness, one transparency, one robustness, one, uh, I don't know, in value that, embedding. I'm involved in one of them called AI nudging. Yeah. Okay, so so that's really the first time that uh, uh, I saw standards explicitly around the AI ethics. But of course, uh, there are standards on AI coming up and already finalized, like from ISO. But also, there will be a lot of standards coming up in Europe from Sentinelec, which is the European official 
com, not company, organizations that define standards that can be used within the European laws. So now that the European AI Act has been approved and with some months and years will be then used all over Europe, then the standards will tell, the standards produced by these organizations and CELNF will define how this uh, uh, law will actually have to be implemented in the various, uh, by the various companies or users and so on. So the many standards will come up uh, very soon from that organization. Yeah, and will, will that lead to like self-regulation more before AI regulation comes up or you see this all together as one effort? Well, again, the, in Europe, the regulation has already been approved by the European Parliament. Now, there are the regulation also says that in six months or one year or two years, there, it has to be implemented parts of the regulation with different timings. So the standards now in Europe, they have to work very fast because by that time when the regulation will have to be applied, the standard has to be in place because otherwise people won't be able to know what to do to actually be compliant uh, to the regulation. Yeah, And that's a sign in U.S., right? So standards have to catch up. Right, right. Yes. But I think there is a role also in the, not just the standards for Europe or US or other regions, but also in these global standards, no? Like the tri- IEEE standards are not for a specific region, they are global, the same ISO standards. So it's very important to have interoperability, no? Over uh, globally, not just within a, a territory. Wonderful. This has been such an informative and exciting conversation about AI. And I know I'm most excited to see the three strongest professional societies, AAAI, AMIA, and ACM, really partner up and have a great collaboration. And with that, are there any parting words that you'd like to share with us? No, but I'm really looking forward for uh, these three societies to collaborate on these topics and to do actual things that can be impactful, inspiring. To have to all the members and beyond the members of these organizations, so but not only inspiring but also very impactful in concrete uh, ways. And thank you for having me. It was a nice chat, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next steps. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. ACM Bycast is a production of the Association for Computing Machineries Practitioner Board. And AMIA's For Your Informatics is a production of Women in AMIA. To learn more about ACM, visit acm.org. And to learn more about AMIA, visit amia.org. For more information about this and other episodes, please visit learning.acm.org slash B-Y-T-E-C-A-S-T. And for AMIA's For Your Informatics podcast, visit the news tab on amia.org.